Okay, hey everybody. Thanks for coming back for week two. Um, I'm glad I didn't offend uh, too many people last week. So um, this was recorded and I put it on YouTube for couple a few people in the choir wanted to come and they can't because they're practicing at seven which I think is a great time but they uh, can't make it at this time so I recorded it and I think 25 people have watched the uh, class which really surprised me but um, thanks for coming come on in George This is the um, most controversial, most uh, nerve-wracking one of these talks, okay? So I don't, and it probably won't bother anyone in here, <laughs> but uh, I'm just used to it bothering people. So uh, does anyone remember what the class is called? Fundamentally drained. Yes, it's fundamentally drained. And what does that mean? Why are we, what is, we explained it last week a little bit. What are we talking about? We said last week we were talking about the statistic, the great de-churching of the United States. Yeah. How many people have left church in the last, what did we say? Uh, Since 2006. I think it's a little early. Since uh, 2000, I think. We said 40 million people, or 15% of the U.S. population who formerly went to church, have stopped going to church. And it's not all COVID, okay? We said, <laughs> uh, we said it um, started, there are reasons for it. Does anyone remember some of the reasons we gave? I don't know why I keep what looking at you, Michael. You weren't here last week, were you? I know. <laughs> what? Getting burnt out on religion. Okay, that wasn't one of the reasons, but that's a good, end yeah, that's the, basically the it. War. What? The end, of the Cold War. end of the Cold War. Yeah, we said, um, these were not, this is again, not my study, not my words. This is just what the people who concluded the study said. Some for work. Um, for work. People worked on Sundays. Some right. As, as more people fit in the <laughs> category that we call it impoverished, they don't have the free time to get off on the weekend and go to church. Um, we said since the end of the Cold War, it's gone down the, the lack of um, unity, the lack of constant threat of nuclear destruction, uh, all of those sorts of things. Um, we said also that, um, golly, I forgot what the, oh, the rise of the religious right. So, and that has pushed people who are considered moderate out of the church because when the right gets further right and the left gets further left, what happens to the middle? I got nowhere to go. <laughs> George gets squeezed out. <laughs> you get squeezed out. You don't have anywhere to go. And the middle is usually what holds people together. And the reason this was interesting to me is because I, as I told you last week, should have been one of those statistics. I quit church. I quit my youth ministry job. I walked away from it in the, my former denomination because I thought I didn't believe in God anymore. Now, I didn't get to do it as fast as I wanted to because it was during the economic downturn 2008 and it was hard to find a job. And I felt like a liar and a hypocrite because I'm working for six months doing this, but my wife was in school. I had little kids. What am I supposed to do? And I told you the story last week how I eventually realize, hey, I'm still praying, and people who don't believe in God <laughs> don't pray, even if they're angry prayers, um, right? That's still acknowledge, acknowledging something. And then I realized over time that my problem wasn't really with God or Jesus. My problem was with this institution I had been a part of my whole life. And then thankfully, something inside of me let me ask a different question, which was, Wait a minute. Um, the majority of people in the Christian world never dreamed of looking at the Bible the way I had been raised to read it. Why am I judging all of faith, all of church, all of Christianity by this one place? I'm going to find out what other people 
think. And all that journey led me to the Episcopal Church, which I didn't go into last week, and I'm not going to go into it. The point is, a lot of people have left church, right? And a lot of the reason they left church is what we said last week, which is the middle has gotten pushed out. And part of the reason the middle has gotten pushed out, or we've taken more extreme views, is because we've twisted Scripture. Do you remember what we said last week that um, we kind of read the Bible as if it was written just to us? Like the Book of Mormon, like this came down in a gold box. No offense if you're watching this and you're a Mormon. <laughs> this will be on YouTube. But, uh, I'm sorry. You just realize you're being taped, and I don't know. So, uh, anyway. But yes, that's how I feel. Sorry. It can, it's, it's all about the individual. It's all about, um, this is for me. This is just for me. But the people who wrote it were members of a what? A tribe. They never thought... Tom Dahlman, what does Tom Dahlman do? What's my identity? What's, uh, what do I like to do? What are my hobbies? They didn't have thoughts like that. They thought, what's my tribe? <laughs> what's good for my tribe? How can I help my tribe? How can I help my family? And maybe somewhere at the bottom of 20 other thoughts they might have thought about themselves. So if that's the way they thought, why do we read scripture through the lens of radical American individuals? We also said that we've all become Gnostics. I, I talked about, do you remember the first heresy of the Christian church was Gnosticism? Do you remember what that was? Does anyone remember? George, George just goes, ugh. Like, run out. Like, oh gosh. This is not, I promise there won't be a test, George. It's okay if you don't know. Knowledge and the desire to get more and more secret knowledge. So that you can right. First century mystery religion, flesh is bad, spirit is good, there's a good God, Jesus, a bad God who is in the Hebrew scriptures, and um, the, this is Gnosticism, and, um, and they were attracted to early Christianity, and there were a lot, of, a lot of that philosophy found its way into the church, that's why the Gospel of John was written, it's why we have... Um, the book of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It's all about, hey, Jesus came in the flesh. Flesh isn't bad. Um, the earth is going to be redeemed, which we'll talk about a different day. Your bodies are redeemed. The scars <clears throat> on your hands, like Jesus, when he's raised, he still has the scars on his hands and feet and his side. Why? Because the scars you've been through, the, prob the pain you've been through, will not be forgotten by God. Um, so I'm, I'm just going off on tangents, okay? <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to build to what we're talking about tonight. So, a lot of people became fundamentally drained, walked away from church because they don't know how God can send someone to hell. So that's what we're talking about tonight. This is like number one taboo subject. Can you hand me one of those sheets, Michael? for a um, Episcopalian to talk about, right? Hell. You have never heard a sermon preached by an Episcopalian on the subject of hell, and uh, I keep waiting for the lectionary reading to come up to give me the opportunity, but I've been waiting eight years, and it hasn't happened yet, or I chickened out when I had the chance. Okay, everyone repeat after me. Tom, Tom is, not is not going to tell me Tell me the, truth the truth about heaven and hell. About heaven and hell. Why isn't he not going to do that? Why isn't he not? You don't repeat that part. Yeah. <laughs> why, why? What? You may not know it. I may not know it. I've never died. I've never gone to heaven or hell. Right? Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody knows. Okay. Um, even in Scripture, when they talk about these things, they say essentially that this is like a straining at something that's beyond our comprehension. Human language can't capture this, right? So I'm going to tell you what I think the ancient church believed about it. And I'm going to tell you what I think Scripture says about it. But I could be totally wrong. Okay? I'm just going to be honest. 
I have no idea. But I have a, I think what I think now, I got more support than I used to have for what I was taught. Does that make sense? Sorry. I'm going to start this here in a second. You guys know I haven't even got to my first slide yet. This is still the intro. Okay. And I'm, I'm also just glad that everyone's smiling and laughing. And we're t talking about hell. So, uh, so... Okay. All right, so... Um, I mean, here's what we're going to do. Here's where we're going tonight. We're going to... Yeah. So, first, first, I'm going to say what most of us were taught about hell, just to make sure we're all on the same page. And then I'm going to talk about what, what do we see in Scripture. I should have said, what do I see in Scripture? But, um, and then, what did the ancient church believe about hell? Okay, that's where we're going. So that's what I'm going to try to get through in about 30 minutes, okay? So, all right. So hell, at least what we heard about it. I came up with five things we can say about hell. The first is that it's eternal. Raise your hand if you heard this. Hell is eternal. Okay, yes. It's eternal. That's what we heard. I'm just going to keep going because we are all in agreement, okay? <laughs> Uh, we also heard that it's eternal punishment, right? So what I assume, based on what I was told, is this. I remember having this conversation in fourth grade Bible class. Fourth grade, Sunday school teacher asked, well, what do you think heaven is like? We all talked about it. What do you think hell is like? Raise my hand. I think that it's a fire where you burn, like, from perfectly together all the way down to nothing but then because it's eternal you're then recreated and then you burn again all the way down to nothing so you just spend eternity being burned alive that's what I said to my Sunday school teacher <laughs> and I remember her thinking or saying I'm going to not ask you any more questions <laughs> and, uh, how, how much you were thinking there though was no different than what I was thinking at the same age in this church Okay, well, that does not give me comfort. Time for change. Well, okay. Right, all right, yeah, so punishment. Um, just for those who couldn't hear George on the recording, George said, yeah, that's what he thought, too. So, uh, all right, I also heard that, I also was taught, it's really easy to end up there, right? Why? What's a verse that says that, or that we twist to say that? The wide path. The wide path, right? The narrow path. Right. Okay, what else? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, yeah, it's harder for the camel to go through the eye of the needle. A rich man to go to the kingdom of heaven. I remember my Sunday school teacher pointing out to me that every single American, even homeless Americans, are rich compared to the standard of the world. So if we're going by the world standard, or the level that Jesus lived in we're all going for the rich thing <laughs> at least that's what I thought as a child okay um, just being honest here this is what I'm just telling you what I was taught okay it's so not what I think now all right it's about justice I want to go back to it's easy to end up there real quick so here's what I was really taught that to go to heaven, I had to hear the gospel, understand it, repent of my sins, and understand it. Or actually, sorry, hear, believe the gospel, so understand and believe all the right things, all right? Confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and understand what that means, which I think is beyond human comprehension also. And then... Um, confess, <laughs> hear, believe, repent, confess, and then be baptized. And know, believe that as I'm being baptized, I'm lost, I'm lost, I'm lost, I'm lost, I'm under the water, still lost, lost, out, saved. I baptized a kid at church camp one time. First time I baptized a kid. 
When you baptize somebody, here, come here, come here, Barbara. <laughs> we gotta make this entertaining for this television. Here, face this way, all right? Uh, sorry, do I have permission to touch you? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, <laughs> okay now, now pinch your nose. Now grab this hand. Grab your hand with that hand. This hand. Yeah. Now grab this hand. There you go. That's how you baptize somebody. That's what I learned. Okay? Okay, you can sit down. Thank you. Um, why do you do it that way? Because the first time I baptized somebody, all I did was pinch their nose and dunk them. So I was nervous. And apparently his hand came up. Never went under. And after the, the guy running the camp, he said, hey, hang back, hang back. You, you and Timmy hang back. So we hung back. And... Um, and he said, you're going to have to do that again. I said, why? His hand never went under. And I said, well, he'll just go to heaven with one arm. <laughs> and he did not like that answer. <laughs> he said, no, we just got to do it right, okay? So, and here's what you do. And I appreciated the instruction. It was very helpful. So this is what you do. And, you know. And I've never made that mistake again because he said, it doesn't say repent and pour some water on you. It says repent and be baptized. And the, that's the literal meaning of that is immersed. And if his hand was up, he wasn't immersed. That's make, that is a pretty easy hell to get into. <laughs> right? Yeah. Am I wrong? That's easy that's hell. There. That is an easy hell to get into. Well, I think it's wonderful that I'm, let's we'll come back to that. Okay, I'm not telling you what I think about. So members of the class are going to have nightmares. All right. So um, we learned that this was about justice. Which, if you're talking about Adolf Hitler, I get it. But if you're talking about a 13-year-old kid who never heard the name of Jesus and had a miserable life and then died a miserable death, that doesn't seem like justice. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's this wonderful book written by Miroslav Wolf about hell. And he, talks, he was, grew up during the Kosovo War. And he said that's the way they got them to stop fighting. The religious leaders on both sides of that conflict went to their people and said, this is for God to decide, not us. And if they hadn't believed in hell, they would have kept killing each other. So maybe there is room to talk about justice. But that's not where we're not done yet, okay? So just hang with me. Um, and all this is good news, right? That's what I heard. Good news. So let's. So this is what is this is sum up what everyone else heard about hell, or many of us heard about hell growing up. Raise your hand if this feels familiar. Pretty much everyone but Barbara is raising their hand. Okay. I went to a Lutheran church. Okay. Oh, well, <laughs> well, isn't isn't that nice for you? Uh, sorry. Sorry. All right, let's uh, let's keep going. So, what began to change my mind about this? Thing? Well, I started reading the Bible for myself. Imagine that. Okay, so here's uh, Romans eight. 31 and 39, which I'm just going to read so they can hear. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus. Who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, 
distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. That does not sound like hell is very easy to get into. Golly, that that person who loves us okay the, the here's what you know the one who has the power to condemn this is what Paul is saying here the only one who gets to make this decision is the one who loved you enough to die for you and the that judge is right now standing before God's throne interceding for you Hey, Larry didn't mean that, you know. Uh, he's doing his best, God. I mean, imagine the nicest person in your life, like your favorite person that you've known for your whole life. The one, that's who, pick that person and then magnify it, right? Better, better than that person. The, all the good stuff you see in that person I think, is a reflection of Jesus. So, that's the one who gets to decide, according to what Paul's saying here. So what other scripture changed my mind? This one is going to be a little weird for you. You might not know where I'm going with this for a second. Okay? And I don't want to read all of it. Will you read the first page, Michael? Yeah. When the Son of Man comes in His glory... And all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand, and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Okay, you want to keep going? Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick, or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Okay. I'm going to keep going because this is where it gets a little more difficult. Then he'll say to those, thanks, Michael. Then he'll say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, gave me no food, I was thirsty. You gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger. You did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when, did, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So, 
You might be thinking, how did that make you not believe or start to question your belief in hell? Well, there's a few things in it. Tell me, tell me where they said the sinner's prayer. Well, tell me about their baptism then. It's not in there. Oh, it's not in there? Who was this hell made for? Was it for these people? It's right out there at the top. Eternal fire prepared for what? Oh my gosh, I had always heard it was built, made for me. In case I did anything wrong. No, it's for the devil and his angels. We could keep going. In the context of Matthew's gospel, um, the least of these generally refers to disciples who are following Jesus, the Galileans. Not We read this in our time to assume that means the poor, because we see least of these. And I think they fit that description. But in Matthew's gospel, this is written to people who have never heard of Jesus, seen Jesus, thought about Jesus, but they met some of these poor disciples of Jesus, which the poor were the ones following Jesus. And they fed them, visited them in prison, took care of them. That is none of the theology I was taught at church. <laughs> Zero of it. Did, did you understand what I'm saying? Like this verse that was so... Um, up front about it's probably the most clear verse about who punishment is for or something in scripture had nothing to do with any of the doctrine I had been taught growing up about how I can avoid hell or make it to heaven um, All if I'm really paying attention and applying this scripture this way I was taught to read scripture there goes my system. My whole system crumbles down from this. It did. So let's keep going. Oh, wow. I wish I would have noticed this. <laughs> I forgot I had this on here. All right. Well, you we already said it all. So you, you can remember it. So who is this punishment for? How much faith did you need to get there? The answer was jack squat. Um, who are the least of these in Matthew's gospel? Here's another one that changed my mind. I'd only heard the first verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but have every, eternal life. And that's where I always stop. And I, gosh, i got to believe. But then we keep going. Indeed, God did not, everyone say, did not, did not send, the send the Son into the world, into the world to, condemn the world. to condemn the world. But in order that, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Does that say that people might be saved through him? The Greek word there is, is, is where we get the word cosmos. So John is talking about creation. Like the entirety of that creation that he started with in John 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was with God. And, and that includes me. That includes that dog that you love, that you uh, have been sad about ever since it died. My, my dog's name was Zipper. It was my uh, senior year of high school, and I had this dog 15 years, growing up with it. So, so most of the verses, I'm going to change gears here for a second. So the popular image of hell place with demons, carrying pitchforks, eternal flaming agony, we inherited from medieval Christian theology, I think Dante's Inferno, stuff like that. St. Augustine was the one who introduced the idea that hell was a subterranean region underneath the earth where people go to be punished. But in the early church, they had kind of a different idea. So, and then our Greek Orthodox and, and Antiochian and Coptic and the folks at Constantinople and the Russian Orthodox, all those folks held on to this other idea that has been present since the early church. And that's what we're going to get to eventually. But 
especially in Matthew's gospel, every time we come across this word Gehenna, we translated it hell, because that's what we thought it meant ever since way back in the King James Bible when we were trying to figure out how to translate not from the Latin for the first time in a thousand years when we had cared about that. So, um, so here's one of these verses. If your right eye, eye causes you to sin, I've, I've changed all of these to say Gehenna instead of hell. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of the members, one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into Gehenna. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into Gehenna. Okay, that's Matthew 5. Here's Matthew 18. Same, he's saying the same thing again. If your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out, throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with the one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the Gehenna of fire. Matthew 23. What do you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross sea and land to make a single convert? And you make the new convert twice as much a child of Gehenna as yourselves. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how can you escape being sentenced to Gehenna? I'm going to make this make sense in a minute, I hope. Uh, Mark 9, same verse, different ver, ver same verse, diff what's, this, what's the statement? <laughs> same same yeah, different verse, same as the first. He, he's saying the same stuff, but if you just take the word and <laughs> instead of inventing a new word from a name and just do what we do with other names in scripture and keep it, you're it's talking about this place called Gehenna. So what the heck was Gehenna? Well, Gehenna was a literal place. It's called the Valley of Hinnom, originally, or son of Hin the Valley of the Son of Hinnom. It was a cultic location in the Canaanite religion where children were offered to the god Molech. So at some point, it was called Topheth, and it's that's the name for the hearth where the child is burned. So still referring to that the practice, that old pagan practice. So in Hebrew it could and in the Ugaritic and Aramaic it could mean furnace or fireplace. So you get what this place was, right? This was a place where this old cultic practice of sacrificing children used to take place. And so and we see in Joshua, Second Chronicles, we see them talking about this valley. Okay? This is a place, this is a bad place. This is a place where we fight. It's a place where the Jebusites were. This is a place where babies are killed. And this is a place where God's people also sacrificed their children when they got desperate. They sold out their God for this God. Okay? And this is really well known in Jesus' day. So, and we see this also in the prophet Jeremiah. I'm going to look at that box on, on your right. Yeah, the right. And they will go on building the high place of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my mind. Therefore the days are surely coming, said, when it will no more be called Tef Tefoth, to Topheth, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. And they will bury Topheth, they will bury the dead in Topheth until there is no more room. Okay, Jeremiah is predicting the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon and then being carried off into exile. And he's using this image of Gehenna to prepare them for that. And he's warning that because you followed after these gods, like the, like the old Canaanites did by sacrificing your children in, to Molech, um, this is going to come about. I'm just setting the scene for what Jesus is saying. But even for Jeremiah, there's hope. He says, the days are coming, says the Lord. City shall be rebuilt. The tower of Hanel to the corner gate and the measuring line shall go out 
further, straight to the hill, Gareb, and then shall be turned to Goa, the whole valley of the dead bodies and ashes, Gehenna, and all the fields as far as the Wadi Kidron to the corner of the horse gate shall be sacred to the Lord. It shall never be uprooted again or overthrown. So in, in other words, this fate was not going to be permanent. So Jesus, when he's turning over the money changers' tables, he's quoting Jeremiah, and he's referring to this constant theme in Scripture of Gehenna, the valley of the son of Hinnom. And he says, and he said it was written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. We could go back and read all that really carefully if you want to, but you can see in there he's quoting Jeremiah. He's using Jeremiah's warning about Jerusalem being overthrown by a foreign oppressor. Who was that foreign oppressor? Starts with a B, ends with Abalon. <laughs> okay, but it's going to be Rome. Yeah, in the time of Jesus, is there a foreign oppressor in Jerusalem? <laughs> yes. Is there a foreign oppressor that the, uh, some of the religious leaders are making deals with to keep the peace? Yeah. It's the same situation again, in other words. Um... Do we have any metaphors like this in the English language that 2,000 years from now they might miss? <laughs> so what if I said, hey, the chickens are coming home to roost. What does that mean? Nothing good, right? Doesn't make any literal sense. I don't think so. <laughs> but we all know what it means, right? But I'll tell you, you write that down, some really weird theology might come out of that 2,000 years ago. You get what I'm saying? What about these chickens? What's their, you know? <laughs> so, uh, do we have any more phrases like that? How about this? It's all going to hit the fan. <laughs> like we all know what that means, right? 2,000 years, it will make no sense. Even between the devil and the deep blue sea. Okay, I don't know that one. The, between the devil and deep blue sea, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, I'm going to, how about this? He went down to Davy Jones' locker. We know what that means. How about this one? He sleeps with the fishes. Right? Godfather? I doubt that'll still be around in 2,000 years. <laughs> okay, I don't know that. Uh, <laughs> So what I'm telling you is that this, there's this literal valley outside of Jerusalem. In the time of Jesus, they use it as a trash heap. This is where they burn their trash. And there's literally a fire there 24-7. Literally an eternal fire. And so Jesus over and over is saying, hey, uh, you're going to be thrown to Gehenna. And... And we have, instead of putting that name of that place in that and recognizing the situation with Rome and how similar it is to the situation with Babylon, and we've just run with it. And we've gotten some weird theology out of it. Well, guess what? I'm going to give you some even weirder theology, but I like it. Okay. Um, so... But before I get there, is it possible, is it just possible that Jesus was not taught warning about a post-mortem experience described by Dante or Jonathan Edwards that was using Gehenna to refer to a horrific devastation that would be wrought against a foreign power, not Babylon, but did we forget to mention that as Matthew is being read the first time, guess what's recently happened? Jerusalem has been destroyed. It's in the recent memory of the people first who first got it. Who, who first had this letter delivered to them from this disciple. Does that account for every verse about hell in the New Testament? No. It accounts for a lot of the ones Jesus is talking about. So, and this is not unique to me, okay? I'm not a genius. This is... I learned this from other people. This is every... This is, most 
uh, scholars in every denomination have understood that we have really misunderstood the doctrine of hell. But they don't know how to talk about it or teach it. Because when you've read something one way for so long, it's really hard to read it in a new way. So here's another scripture that changed my mind. Okay, and this is where you got to hang with me. And this is where it gets super weird, okay? Okay, if you're a cradle Episcopalian, is there a single cradle Episcopalian? George, George, you should understand this, okay? Oh, oh yeah, just naturally. Okay, I really might have set myself up for failure Nancy's there. Oh, Nancy Barrett, yeah, okay. So, uh, and when I was a kid, this verse was in a book called Scriptures That Are Hard to Understand. <laughs> And I would ask preachers all the time, what the heck does this mean? And they'd say, I don't know. You should go read that book by Jack Lewis, who was, went to Harvard, genius guy, taught at Harding Graduate School of Religion. But you know what? I read the chapter, and he said, this is hard to understand. <laughs> so anyway, I don't, I don't think it's that as hard as I used to think it was. It's still difficult, but. For Christ suffered, also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which... So he's made alive in the Spirit, he's died, he's now alive in the Spirit, in which he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, which a few, that is, eight people were saved through water. And then he goes on to start talking about baptism. So, we've got this kind of hard to understand verse from the time of the ancient church. And it's saying that Jesus, after he died, went to the place of the dead and preached. It's pretty interesting. So, hold that thought in your mind. And then I want you to think about this. What is the very first thing God creates? Hmm? The heavens and the earth, right? In the beginning, right? And then what does he make on the first day? He makes what? Light. Light, right? Right? Well, how do we measure time in on planet Earth. <laughs> With what? The revolution of the Earth around the sun, right? And the light, the night and the day, how long does it take us to get around the sun? Right? 24 hours, give or take. I don't know, a second or two. So, but that's probably the most controversial thing I said on this. People have thought about that second or two. Um, it keeps getting the calendar readjusted. But um, my point is, there's a sense in which you could say one of the earliest creations is time, right? And time is the first thing that God makes holy. There's a day that's set aside, that's made holy. What day is it? And not only, that's not just for people to rest, but who else rested on that day? God. That's weird. Um, I didn't know God needed to rest, but... We need to rest too, apparently. So, my point is, time is part of this created world. God exists where? Outside of time. In it and out of it. So where, according to 1 Peter, is Jesus right now? He's everywhere. He's everywhere, yeah. He exists outside of time. Where is he? He he uh he's at the beginning. He's at the end. But he's also here. He's in the prison. And what's he doing? What does it say he's doing? He's preaching. He's down there and he's saying, or up there, over there, wherever. Hey, 
You know you don't have to stay here, right? I died on that cross. Did you see it? I also walked out of the grave. You don't have to stay here. I don't know about this, Jesus. I feel like I have to stay here. No, you don't. (laughs) You just got to open your eyes. Okay? Now, here's where it's going to get even more weird. Okay? Here's the big point. If you don't get anything else, get this. We have reduced, in the modern era, the church I grew up in, in lots of places, we've reduced the gospel to a message about salvation from hell. That is a big reduction. So when Jesus and the apostles, the disciples, were going around preaching, they weren't saying, hey, come get your get-out-of-jail-free card, right? They weren't like just passing out baptisms to get people out of hell. What were they saying? The kingdom of God is near. Come into this new life, this new way of being in the world, this new reality that is hard to see. You can't see it, but you get a foretaste of it now. It was not about your get out of hell free card. And we've turned, we've reduced the gospel to And it's essentially Greco-Roman paganism repackaged. Because we don't call it Valhalla anymore. We call it heaven. You get to be this spirit floating in a cloud up in heaven playing a harp. Okay, that is not the image we see anywhere in Scripture. There's this new heaven and new earth at the end of Scripture. And it's physical. It's more physical then we are here. Um, That's the big point. If you don't get anything else, that's the big point I want you to get. But now here's the big what if, wondering. Here's the real money. Here's the selling point for the whole class, okay? Um, Heaven and hell. Okay, I'm going to tell you this. Heaven and hell are the same place. This is what the early Christians believed, and this is what our Greek Orthodox our Orthodox sisters and brothers, brothers and sisters, however you want to say it, believe. Heaven and hell are the same place. That's why Jesus is there right now. There are states of being that come about when we encounter God, whom Scripture refers to over and over and over again as a consuming fire. And God's presence either causes us to withdraw within ourselves or to reach out and be consumed and healed. This is what Peter or Paul was talking about when he said each of us will pass through the fire. Do you remember that verse? As through like some and and the works that are in it will be revealed. And he basically says, but you'll all be saved by the skin of your teeth. Also a hard to understand verse. Um, if you forget God is fire, like fire, which I forgot all the time, because I thought he was just an old man with a big white beard, like Zeus or Odin, because that's the picture I had in my head. So maybe, what if the states we call heaven and hell, and this is what ancient Christians thought, begin here in this life, and then they're consummated in the life to come. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to keep giving you some what-ifs, okay? If, if we have allowed our hearts to be purified, then we'll experience God's presence, and it'll feel, healing, feel like healing, it'll feel joyful, it'll be life-giving. If we refuse that, His love will feel not good, like a fire. Um... So here's the question. Maybe to illustrate my point. um, Can love ever hurt? Raise your hand if you think it can. Say more about that. (laughs) Somebody in this class said definitely love can hurt. (laughs) Love bites. 
bites. Love bites. Yeah, right. Yeah. Weddings. Adam Sandler weddings. Can love hurt? Yes, it can. Here and what I'm telling you. I mean, the last five slides is straight from like some Uber. I mean, I'm just, I'm just giving you old school Orthodox theology. Okay. Um. So have you anyone heard of the parable of the prodigal son? Yes. Oh, you have. Oh my gosh. Good, you guys are good Bible students. Um, so, did the love of the father hurt the older brother? He did not like it. He hated it. He said it was unfair. For the older brother, the father's perfect love was painful. Um... How do people in Scripture react to Jesus' miracles? Two ways, right? What? Fear and wonder. Fear and wonder. Yeah, in fact, they're, in fact they're, they're overjoyed by God's love and mercy or they're driven into dark bitterness and hate. That's the reaction we see in Scripture. That, that kind of love hurt. You're not supposed to love those people. Not those kind of people. Um, In fact, that's the darkness that drove a mob to crucify love himself. That's what scripture says. That's what the ancient church believed. This is because Jesus never forces a response, right? He just loves. He just heals. What you do with that is up to you. You have the freedom to react however you want. And, and we have a really great guy in our church. Um, why does it seem like Scripture is referring to places? His name's C.S. Lewis. Has anyone heard of him? Because I grew up reading his stuff in my old tradition, but they always just said this is a cool devotional thought about... But truthfully, C.S. Lewis had read uh, all these ancient church fathers, and just his books are based on this old school theology. Okay? So there's this book. Anyone read the Chronicles of Narnia? (laughs) Remember the last scene of it, the last battle? Um, The people are wanting, like the kids who are with Aslan, they're wondering, what about these, uh, you know, what. What about the people we left back there who aren't here? And he said, oh, they, they're all here. Look, there's the dwarves. Who, the dwarves who hadn't accepted Aslan, Aslan. They're there. They're in heaven. God's country. Aslan's country. But he said they're blind to everything that's around them. And, and, and one of the kids says, well, give them some food. So Aslan says, okay, I'll, I'll show you. Gives them The same food they've been eating, the wonderful wine they've been drinking, but to them it tastes disgusting. They're in hell. Um, But where is the hell coming from? Aslan says they won't let us help them. Their prison is only in their own minds. Yet they are in that prison and so afraid of being taken in so afraid of being taken in that they cannot be taken out. So, there's another book where he talks about the same thing, The Great Divorce. Has anyone read that? In The Great Divorce, there's a bus that goes from hell to heaven every day. (laughs) And you can get on it and ride, and you can meet your ancestors or your family. And the family meets them at the stop, and they're like, hey, you should stay. You don't have to get back on the bus and go back down. And they say, no, no, the light hurts my eyes here. The grass hurts my feet. Um, I'm so wispy and whatever, I can't even break the surface of the water. This is too real for me. And whenever I look at that bright light over there, it hurts my eyes, which is God. And, and he's just quoting, C.S. Lewis is just doing, that's a riff on Gregory of Nyssa. So...
you get to decide now. <laughs> okay, here, here's my whole point that I wanted to make. So what was the big point, Michael, to close this out? I like to pick on you. Remember, it was 20 slides ago. <laughs> yes. We've reduced the gospel to a message about hell. Salvation. My get out of hell free card. That is not... And as long as that's what we're reducing our, the gospel to, we, we're, we sh- we're just going to keep emptying the church. But if it's about life, joy, about trying to wake people up, hey, you don't have to stay in this prison anymore. Here or there. Free will exists in both places. You can leave. In fact, Jesus is there in their blind. Hey, come on. That's the oldest Christian message. And we even say it in the creed every Sunday. He descended to the dead. The old translation said he descended into hell. He's there. Um, that, that, so that's the oldest point about um, heaven and hell. So next week we're going to talk about the cross. No pressure, right? All right. Thanks, everybody. We have Compline in five minutes. And Evie is reading tonight.